Let us pray. Gracious God, we give you thanks for the fact that in the end, you always do provide. As we struggle to hear what is right, we try struggle to hear your voice speaking in the midst of the clamor of life. Let us always trust that in the end, you do provide, you do speak to us, and there is a way forward. Amen. I get into trouble a lot. I get into trouble for forgetting to unpack the dishwasher or putting dirty dishes in a clean dishwasher. I get into trouble when I ask uh, my kids too many questions about their friends and I get into trouble when I make bad dad jokes. I get into trouble when I mess up the videoing at church and I get into trouble got into really big trouble this week when I used the wrong oat bran. I get into trouble when I burp or worse. And most of the ways I get into trouble are not actually unique to me. I'm sure at least one of those spoke to you. Many people have these mini arguments in their friend groups or within their families about similar things, don't we? But one thing I sometimes get into trouble for is something really only ministers and preachers have to face. And this week, I got into trouble for picking a difficult reading for church. Again. If you remember last week, we looked at a a passage from Romans, which seemed to be all about crucifixion and death, which it was. But in the end, it was actually mainly about the way that dying to self gives us a wonderful and mysterious and deep kind of freedom. And it was a fantastic reading in the end. But it is a reading that is really, really difficult to find a simple uh, or even uh, a simple way to explain to children or to find a storybook which illustrates the point nicely. And so I got into trouble for that. And today's reading is also a problem, isn't it? Not because it's as difficult to understand. Genesis 22 is is a painfully simple story to follow, isn't it? But rather because the events of Abraham and Isaac and God on that mountain ask some deep and difficult questions about who we truly believe that God is. And without some, some solid theological work, we might easily become confused, or worse. And again, this makes picking a kid story really, really difficult. And this is why I got into trouble again this week. So the story we need to reflect on today is the almost sacrifice, the almost sacrifice of Isaac by his father Abraham. And already I am sure that most of you are familiar with the story. And I would doubt there are many of us who hold the story up as one of our favorites, do we? You see, it is one of those those terrifying stories in the Old Testament which trigger our deepest fears about who God might be and what God might be capable of. And the events begin with God deciding to test Abraham by asking him to sacrifice his son Isaac, his only son, the son that Abraham and Sarah had waited so long for, the son that was clearly the ultimate blessing from God. Now, we're we're not told just why God decided that Abraham needed to be tested or why this was a good way to test him, but Abraham dutifully prepares himself for the journey, and heads off with Isaac. And if things aren't bad already, there is a long conversation between Isaac and Abraham about just where they are going and why. And it lifts the poignancy and, and, and the tragedy of the tale up 
its emotional volume is raised. And so they go to the place and prepare the sacrifice, and at the last second, God intervenes again. And a lamb is given in replacement for Isaac in the sacrifice. Isaac is spared, and Abraham, we presume, is relieved. Stories like this terrify us because they go to the heart of our deepest fears. What is more horrifying than the notion of a parent killing a child for whatever reason? We do know it happens sometimes, but events like this make us speechless. There are simply no words. As Christians, as believers, it is even worse because it looks like God is complicit in this, this murder or near murder. And even if it is simply a test, it's a cruel and fiendish test. It has no humor or teaching value, value in it and would serve just to, to, to grow resentment. To obey, but to do so purely out of fear. Which is why this reading sits in our memories, doesn't it? But we struggle with it at the same time. So why did I pick it this morning? There were three other perfectly satisfactory readings to choose from in the lectionary, as well as, well, just about anything else in Scripture. And the reason I chose it is because it makes us think again about the way we treat our children and our children's children. It makes us think about the future of humanity and where the voice of God is truly speaking in the choices we make. Let me explain. There are two things that I think Christians need to do when we confront difficult passages like this especially those in the Old Testament. And the first thing to do is to realize that these readings are not simple stories. Instead, they are stories which have been told and retold over, over decades and, and, and hundreds of years. And they've been finally crystallized in a form that isn't simply about the event, but is more about emphasizing the competing theologies and philosophies, the competing patterns of thought that the people struggle with. All those people who hold Abraham up as their forefather. And this includes the Jewish people, of course, but many other tribal groups and nations of the ancient world. And the big question, then, of Abraham's sacrifice is simple. What does God demand of us in the end? Does he require that we sacrifice things that are dearest to us, even our children? And then, why are sacrifices required in the first place? Why does God need them at all? The most dominant answer in human history has been that God is God, and God demands what God demands, and when God demands sacrifice, our only response is obedience. But in the midst of this reading, there is another small voice, a voice which says, hang on, in the end, in the end, God provides an alternate sacrifice, a free gift, which meant that God didn't really need God's, uh, Abraham's sacrifice at all. Isaac didn't really need to die. Perhaps, perhaps Abraham wasn't hearing God right in the first place. And perhaps all of you, all of us, haven't been hearing God right when we think that's what God desires. And as Christians, we know, don't we, that when Jesus comes down, he does so on the side of this small voice. The one that says that God might require complete sacrifice, but that God, paradoxically, also provides the sacrifice so that we don't need to sacrifice our own children, the things that are dear to us. 
And to anyone who thinks that God does demand this kind of sacrifice, well, you are listening to the wrong voices. In fact, says Jesus, in fact, when you think God is asking you to kill others, even to kill your own children, that is never God speaking. In, instead, that is your most evil and sinful human nature coming to the fore. When you think that God requires this kind of sacrifice, you have simply been making yourself into God again, just like Abraham did, just as the Jewish leaders did when they feared Jesus, just as we do time and time again. We don't kill our children, do we? And we are horrified at that. Except, except humankind has been killing their children from generation to generation from the beginning of time. And if you don't believe me, you should probably look up the names of Admiral Charles Fitzgerald, that's a good name, and uh, an author from about 100 years ago, Mrs. Humphrey Ward. Anyone heard those names? I hadn't before I was researching this. Anyway, these two illustrious figures established what was called the Order of the White Feather in 1914. Have you heard of the Order of the White Feather? And in the Order of White Feather, the Order of the White Feather was tasked with encouraging women around the British Empire to give white feathers to men who hadn't, young men, boys, who hadn't joined the army so that they would be shamed into going to war. 100 years ago. And this is not the first time. Throughout our history as humanity, we have so often sent our sons to die we have sacrificed our children and tried to pretend that it was noble. Luckily, we don't do that anymore, at least not here in nice, civilised Australia. But what we do do here is in some ways more insidious. Because as a society, haven't we built an economy which robs from the future, robs from our children, as they are saddled with the massive problems which have come as a result, as a direct result of our selfishness. And there are indeed poorer, older people in our society, indeed. But as a group in Australia, it is our young adults who face the greatest of economic hardships. Looking a bit more broadly around the world, it is the problem of climate change and environmental destruction which so many of us have been involved in causing, which will be their job to clean up. We have left our future generations to clean up our mess, to suffer, to sacrifice themselves at the altar of our life. Partly because we lack the humility or will to deal with it ourselves. And so even though the white feather has gone out of fashion, we have continued to sacrifice the future of our children. And what's worse, we have often pretended that that sacrifice arises from our faith in God, deluding ourselves into a deep and profound blasphemy. But our Lord is not that kind of God. And Jesus always gives us a different option. Because in Jesus, we are told that sacrifice is always self-sacrifice and trust. We don't sacrifice others. We don't sacrifice our children. We give up of ourselves so that others may live, others may flourish. The way of Jesus is to take sides in the battle for what is right in our culture, within our families and within our countries, and come down upon the side of what is good and life-giving. The way of Jesus is to trust that God will provide all we need. And that don't means we don't need to go away and sacrifice others, especially our dear ones. 
because of our own fear. It's, it may seem strange for me to say this, but I think in the end, the story of Abraham and Isaac is really, really good news. Because in this story, the assumed violence and demand of God is broken by the small voice which saves Isaac. And the violence of humanity which we push onto God is finally and forever broken when Jesus dies upon the cross. And it is broken again in our lives whenever we take sides with Jesus. Amen.